All right, everybody. So we're going to go ahead and do our intro to sociology chapter one lecture. Um, let me go ahead and get this and share my screen. Figured I'd do them outside since it's actually nice out. All right. I am not going to get into all of the questions that were in those first couple of slides, mostly because those are just kind of your gauge to figure out if you are um, getting to or getting the concepts that you need to get. Those are the questions that you need to be able to answer yourself if you are going through that, okay? All right. Do, 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 do. All right, so for some basic definitions, sociology um, is really the study of how humans and society interact. And that's at multiple levels, right? So you're gonna see how societies, rules, our constructs, our um, understandings, our languages, our culture, all impact a human's possibilities and or impact a human's um, even notion of self, right? So when it's tied to a societal idea or structure, you're going to see that be sociology. On the flip side, you're also going to see how individuals or groups of individuals impact societal ideas. Um, not just their ideas, but also how the institutions run, how um, we change institutions, how we change laws, how we, um, what we value, those four things about a society, right? Um, so the interaction is both ways. It's both how society interacts with humans and how humans interact with that society, right? Because ultimately, those things happen in a circular motion. And so we're going to kind of get into some of that. I'm sorry. Apparently, there's a very loud truck that just decided to drive past. Um, and one way your chapter starts to get you to think about um, how issues might be impacted by your society, your, your own issues, is that you have things like personal trouble and public issues. So you have things that um, are more individually based by your, that are a private experience maybe, or something to that nature. Um, whereas a public issue is going to be something that is linked to any kind of institution or historical um, situation. So for instance, if you have an issue maybe in what you didn't get teached in a public school system or something, you're going to have, that's going to be more of a public issue conversation because you're not making the curriculum yourself for what you did or did not learn in your public education system, if that makes sense. Um, versus like, maybe um, I got diagnosed with this particular <clears throat> ailment or this particular medical health issue. And this medical health issue um causes me certain kinds of physiological symptoms, right? Um, so that that might be a personal trouble. Now, it may also be linked to public issues such as access to health care, such as income to be able to get your medications, um, whether or not the medications are even exist to begin with, depending on how rare the ailment is. So there's a lot of different things, um, whether or not your insurance covers it, that can be both, right? They're going to tie into each other. And that's kind of how we're, what we're going to learn about as we move forward. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about your sociological imagination. And basically, that's just your ability as a human to apply kind of that outward and inward view of how society is interacting with humans and how humans are interacting with society in your everyday life, right? So when you are looking at a situation, um, Say you're looking at something that you saw in the news, right? So your sociological imagination would allow you to look at that and say, oh, that really sucked for that particular group of people or that particular person. But it would also allow you to look at it and say, what, what things could have caused this or could have prevented this? And that just allows your brain to kind of tick at a different level. It allows you to kind of seek out a perspective that is not just individually based, but also gears towards looking at what are the values of our society? What are the things that we're looking at? Um, and how might these be impacting people in different ways, right? Um, and so it requires us, and they talk about this, to kind of think ourselves away and from the familiar routines of daily life in order to understand a larger meaning. So again, that's getting at perspective, right? We're not gonna just look at the perspective of, this is how I viewed the world, this is how I've been taught, this is how I've learned, but really to understand that there's multiple different perspectives in our society and that those, and how society deems each person or labels each person 
or how society interacts with each kind of person or limits the possibilities or opportunities depending on all your different statuses will impact how you what what opportunities you have what um kinds of oppressions you have and so we're going to really get into the fact that these different perspectives at a larger scale to kind of be able to look at it so that when you are having individual conversations or you looking at a very individualized um concept or or experience you can look at it um and now there's an airplane randomly flying um but you can look at it from the lens of and also societies these are the layers that might be impacting this particular thing, just like we just did with the medical ailment, right? So yes, that medical ailment is a personal experience, but the way we structure healthcare, the way we structure insurance, the way we structure income, all of these things are going to impact that person's ability to aid um, in their medical ailment or be able to access the care for that ailment, okay? So that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about really how all of these different structures impact a personal situation. Um, and so when we do that, we're gonna look at how, again, and this is this is exactly what I'm talking about, this, um, this way in which human societies are always a process of structuralization. So we always essentially level or put boxes on things. And in order to make connections, we have to really talk about the overlap. We have to talk about the way in which we shape those boxes, the way in which those boxes carry meaning for different people. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about globalization in the sense that at this point, we live in a world where due to the interconnectedness of both economic systems, um, language systems, social media systems, all of these things, we live in a very connected, global, globally connected way. And all of those political and economic and social interconnectedness um, impact the individuals throughout the world and impact the cultures throughout the world. Um, okay, so we're also going to talk about how social change will impact um, sociological perspective, correct? So like anytime you see change in institutions or change in um in how or the way we think about any kind of particular idea in society, it is generally due to some kind of social change. Now, not all social change means it's like for the good, right? Some social change is not. Some social change is for um, economic um, prospects for specific kinds of people, right? So, but there is a lot of radical social change that impacts our world in a positive way. And those particular kinds of social changes is part of the sociological idea and um, most um, active researching sociologists are looking at a particular topic in order to try to garner resources or to allow for space for a, a, better, a better lived experience for someone who is affected by a particular kind of outcome, right? So depending on what you're researching. All right. So let's talk about some sociological theory. Um, we're not gonna get super deep into this, but I do want you to kind of get these core principles, okay? So a theory, really what a sociological theory is doing is it's saying, okay, this is happening in society for probably these reasons. And no sociological theory is perfect 100% of the time. And part of that is because of the interconnectedness and the way in which multiple layers of things impact each other. So like if you have a social theory on an institution and you're not taking account the both individual and the institution and also the grand bigger society's ideas and the institution, then you obviously can't get it all. That doesn't mean you won't be able to kind of portray how some internal institutions might be working, right? Um, and so it's important to realize that we have different sociological theories at different levels intentionally to kind of garner exactly what it is. So like I study accommodations practices at um, universities and what it means to be disabled at an academic level, right? Um, and if people who survive trauma um, 
consider themselves in that um, particular definition. Because if they don't, then does that limit their ability to get um, accommodations? Now, I'm not more than likely going to be using some super big theories, but I am going to be talking about pedagogical theories in my research. Why? Because those theories are getting at exactly within the institution I am working, which is colleges, um, what I'm getting at. Now, that doesn't mean that the broader um, broader society doesn't impact those sociological theories. It's just talking about the fact that I'm narrowing it down because of this research. And that's kind of what sociological theory does. It gives you multitudes of layers so that you can look at it from all of those different perspectives and all of those different, um, all of those different micro and macro levels of um, interaction, okay? And so we're gonna get at some of those main key research or main key, we'll call them forefathers um, of sociological theory. And then we'll kind of keep going. You probably won't get much more into theory in um, besides kind of these key ones, these key big ones um, in this class. Um, so when we talk about economic theory, you're really gonna come down to, um, well, okay. We're gonna back up a little. So Comte is someone who was born during an upheaval in an industrial Western Europe. And that really shaped his ideas in the sense that he was looking at the world through a lens of this very industrialized Europe, uh, European nation that was in serious turmoil. So he was looking through a particular lens and that, um, and while he was really, studying more philosophy, um, he also uh, was describing society as it was functioning during the middle of this upheaval, or maybe not functioning during the middle of this upheaval. And that kind of gave birth, I guess, to this idea that we could look at society and its impact on individuals, and we could look at that relationship. Um, so they call him the father of sociology. Again, some of this is debated, depend on who you get into, but you're not going to get into any of that at, at this stage in this. Um, really, the reason that they give him the most credit is because he gave it the name. <laughs> um, the, people were studying that interaction before this. The problem was that they weren't naming this as its own kind of discipline or its own kind of thought process. Um, and that's what Comte did. He really came through and he said, here's what sociology is going to be. And we're going to label this kind of science when we're looking at this kinds of things as sociology. Um, he was also a soci pol social policy maker. So he was really, um, saw sociology as this tool to research or to look at um, particular strifes that were happening in society and create better systems to help out um, those who were experiencing negative income. So we're talking about Again, during the uh, um, Industrial Revolution, we're talking about increased income inequality. We're talking about um, severe poverty. We're talking about poverty at levels that caused um, severe um, uh, homelessness, uh, lack of being able to find things to eat. And so really, how, are, how can we use this idea, this, this research, to improve the lives of other people? Um, and so then we're going to get into Durkheim. Durkheim was drawing on really this notion of sociology as a science, but he really wanted to drill down the procedural ways of this. He wanted to figure out how we can study facts and make it very scientific, very mathematical. Um, and in doing that, he really was looking at the aspects of social life that shape our actions as individuals. Um, and he saw society as this body that needed all its parts to function. So he was very, he is what we call a functionalist in the sense that without any portion of society, good, bad, or otherwise, it's not going to function as a whole. And so really what he was doing was trying to figure out if there was a way uh, to study all these moving parts um, as specific parts of this function, of this broader function. Um, and he really saw that, he really thought that this worked very harmoniously, that all of these different institutions have to work harmoniously, because if not, then they don't, fun then then the whole system, the whole society doesn't function well, right? Um, and in some 
again, again, in some cases, this worked really well. In others, especially like when you're talking about upheaval or systems that are breaking down, you're really looking at the ways it was dysfunctional or the ways that long time um, parts that some people that were functional weren't working for others, right? So like, um, again, just like any other theory we're going to talk about, there are things that it worked really well for and things that it maybe didn't. Um, he really talked about, again, he was really hammered into this idea of like organic solidarity or this idea, again, remember that he felt like society was more like a body. So everything had its purpose. Um, again, good, bad, or otherwise, including crime, including um, any kind of oppression, any kind of those systems, any kind of class structure, any kind of um, thing in that nature. He really saw that as part of a system that, and it was necessary. Um, he argued that cooperation was key. Um, so all of these different functions, all of these different groups, all of these different institutions had to cooperate or the functionality, again, of the body as a whole or the society as a whole would not operate correctly. Um, we are also going to talk about social constraint, which is the conditioning influence of our behavior by groups or societies. So essentially, we're going to talk about this in the sense that by group cooperation, um, we're going to take this a step further and essentially say that when a whole group is doing something, no one individual is going to really like starkly um, come out. And you see this in, say, and and go against it. So you see this in like, for example, you'll see experiments such as um, like a whole group witnessing a crime, but nobody's stopping it because if one person's not going to stop it, then they're all not going to stop it kind of situation. Um, but he studied this effect in suicides. And we're not going to get into the totality of his um, study, but it does talk about it a bit in your book. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into this in super big detail, but he understood this as a personal problem, uh, even though he was studying it sociologically, um, that changes in the modern world were so rapid that it gave people major social difficulties, which led to the feelings of hopelessness and aimlessness or anomie. Um, and that's really just this idea that again, due to someone's sociological circumstances and using your sociological imagination, due to all the social circumstances, someone was feeling in a way that discredited um, their, their place in that particular social function is how he was viewing this, okay? Um, then we have Marx. Marx is a name we know well, but we don't often, uh, in society, but we don't often view it as it actually is. Um, he really was an economic sociologist that was studying on materialist and really uh, breaking down the structure that is capitalism um, and showing its flaws and also showing its function, right? So he wanted to see how that worked. But in doing so, he really recognized that the world benefited some over others and that that link to material um, capacities um, or capabilities or opportunities, um, any of those things really led to um, this conflict, this notion of some people are going to have significantly more, some people are going to have significantly less. And that's not a normal aspect. That's something that we have intentionally put into this capitalist structure in order to keep um, a labor force in order to keep people having to work, some people having to work and some people having to do so at a less level, and then some people really benefiting from other people's work. Um, and so really, he was really, really big on uh, studying capitalism, which is the economic system based on private ownership of wealth, which is invested and reinvested to produce profit. So capitalism is the economic structure that we currently um, globally and um, nationally um, and even really individually interact with. And that's really just this idea that someone can acquire wealth and keep putting it into more things um, as opposed to sit like for themselves to benefit self um, as opposed to an economic structure where it's say going into taxes or where it's say going into society building or where it's maybe more evenly distributed or after a certain amount of um, 
income percentage or not income percentage, profit percentage that you make, you have to reinvest back into the employees or something of that nature, right? So this is this is a structure that is solely based on the ideas of trying to take that economic system and um, make sure that it has, it is giving to the particular people that can feed into it or can be part of it at that investor level. Um, and he predicted that in the future, capitalism would be uh, supplanted by a classless system um, in which there would be no divisions between rich and poor. Now, part of the things that, um, part of the biggest critiques of Marx is this idea that uh, because we have oppressive structures that are in this system, that they might carry over into a system um, that was more socialist. And that's essentially, um, people are always talking about the countries that currently have socialism and why that doesn't work. Well, the the problem is that in Marx's vision of socialism, there was not these hierarchies. They weren't these social divisions in the same ways. Whereas what you saw in most socialist systems today is that yes, things are divided, um, but they're still divided to benefit certain people more than others. So it's still divided in a way of control. There's still those social hierarchies built in to those systems. And that's not the idea that he had it's um but it is a more realistic way to think about it because what happens is that those social inequalities don't just rapidly vanish because we have had um we have had these inequalities for so long that people um that people would rebel against them but he thought that under once we got into this communal ownership, that more equality would be established and stabilized. And again, that's not to say that there wouldn't still be divisions, but it would be divisions in a little bit different of a source. And there would still be a lot more community based ideologies. And we just have never actually seen that come to pass at this point. Um, until the fall of Soviet communism in the early 1990s, more than one third of the world population lived in societies whose government claimed to be derived their inspiration from Marx's ideas, including some of uh, including some of the leadership here in the United States as well. Um, Marx's ideas are based on really trying to in, um, influence inequality in a positive way and really trying to level out things. Um, he did have his own issues when it came to gender and some of the other things. But again, he was really trying to show people that, hey, this is going to provide conflict. This is going to provide negative outcomes in a society. And really, if we do not figure out how to um, create institutions that are more driven on equality, we aren't going to succeed as a society for an extended period of time. Um, and we've seen the downfall of many societies over the course of history due to the fact that the inequalities got so vast that there were revolutions or there were uprisings. Um, and so that's, um, it's something to keep in mind as we kind of move through uh, the material. And we have Weber and he agreed with Marx um, that changes in the economy played a crucial role in the broader shifts taking place. But he emphasized that this was really based on the, the importance of culture and ideas. So he was really looking at things from a very um, different lens. He studied more aspects, including religion, law, power. Um, and he was really wanted to focus on large scale social institutions, especially religion. Um, and he wanted to understand how changes in these aspects of social institutions affected individuals and how they felt or understood their lives. So he was really saying, okay, I'm gonna look at this macro level, big things such as religion or economics. And I wanna see how it impacts how people understand their lives. So not the actual situations they're in, but how they understand them. Um, and so for instance, he was, um, he studied a lot about how um, individuals within certain kinds of religions or Christianities felt about being um, having less in the way of income. And if they saw that in the same way as maybe somebody from a different religion, such as that. Um, all right. So Miss Harriet, she was a scholar and an activist who brought 
um, sociology to England when she translated Comte's work. Um, she was a prominent female scholar in the era um, that was very much the exception. So, right, this was not a time in which um, there were a lot of female um, scholarship, and this is somebody whose name um, doesn't get brought up when you generally talk about sociological sociological beginnings a whole lot, and it's, I'm glad that they have her in here. But she was um, a big proponent of women's rights and the emancipation of slaves, because again, we're talking about social inequality. It becomes a very big driving point for early sociologists. Um, she studied, uh, in one of the studies, she focused on all of its aspects, including key pol political, religious, and social institutions. Um, she really wanted to analyze society and understand that the lens um, of gender can impact how society affects someone. Um, and so that's a really big kind of sticking point. Um, it was the first time a sociological eye um, was really turned on uh, things such as the more inside the household kind of things, right? So we, we tended to separate um, private institutions, private social institutions and public social institutions in a way where social institutions like economics had consistently been talked about, but things like marriage, children, domestic and religious life um, and race relations, those things that were at an interpersonal level really got overlooked in a lot of ways. And she really was talking through that. Um, and that she really thought that sociology was a way to be um, an activist. It was a way to really um, change the world in a positive notion. And then we have W-E-D-B, W-E-B, D, Du Bois. Jeez, bro, sorry, I am tongue-tied today. But he was the first significant African-American sociologist and was a founding member of the NAACP. Um, his work really was noteworthy because it emphasized um, marginalization and specifically was really where we started talking about race in a, in a big way. Um, he talked about double consciousness, which is this um, way African-Americans must see themselves not only through their own eyes, but it also see it has to see itself through the ways in which society treats people, um, especially them. So like, for instance, a Black person can't just, in the same way that a Black mom is going to have to teach a Black um, son things about society and the way they're going to be viewed, they're going to view him as a threat he also has to see himself for the fact that he's not, right? Um, but the fact that society looks through the eyes in a way that is degrading is something that particular marginalized groups, and this and this comes, he was really studying African-American individuals, um, but really you could get down to several marginalized groups in this country, including like um, uh, any kind of Latinx, um, especially immigra immigrants um, of all kinds, um, really anyone who doesn't, um, speak English, um, as their first language, all of these things, this double consciousness idea of having to see yourself the way you see yourself, but also having to see yourself the way society is and kind of reroute maybe some of the ways, um, that provides a negative self-identity, um, and try to figure out how, uh, how to mold through the world knowing that society is going to cap you and label you in this way. Um, and then we also have, uh, and then he also really wanted to talk about the legacy of slavery um, on uh, in the U.S. and how it's impacted Black communities. Um, so we're going to talk about Mead real quick, and Mead um, is describes something called symbolic interactionism. And he really talked about the ways that roles as symbols and language record a human interaction. So he was really talking about the fact that the way we talk about things matters and the way language is used is going to impact our um, positive or negative feelings or thoughts on a particular, um, about particular groups, about ourselves, about um, a particular thing in society. Um, and a symbol just broadly is an item used to stand or represent something else. Um, and so symbolic interactionists really believe that there's virtually all interactions between individuals 
involve an exchange of symbols, right? So we either talk, we're either using our hands, we're writing, we're um, using art, we're using some form of expression to interact with other people. And through those interactions, we look for cues to kind of discern uh, markers. So through our body language, we're going to express whether we're confident, whether we are nervous in a situation, whether we like somebody, whether we're mad, whether we're happy. All of these things can be interpreted through our actions and our words, right? Um, again, functionalism, going back to kind of that idea that everything is a body, everything is a whole, and it's all of the different parts serve a particular purpose. Um, and that we have manifest functions are the functions that are particular to social activity and they're known and they're intended. And then there's latent functions. Those are the things that are unintended consequences, essentially, of those, those other functionalities. And then you have conflict theory, which really stemmed out of Marx, and that's your sociological perspective, where it emphasizes how political and economic power and oppression um, impacts the social order, impacts the hierarchy of society and really impacts how individuals um, move through life or lack the ability to move through life. Um, two particular approaches typically classified under this are under conflict theories are Marx theories and feminist theories and sometimes those interact. Um, Marx theories are a body driving of the main um, ideas of Karl Marx and they're really driven around class conflict, around economics and around economic power. Um, Power being the ability of individuals or members of groups to achieve aims to further the interests that they hold and or um, be able to exert um, their ideas onto others due to the amount of social um, impact they can have. Ideologies or shared ideas or beliefs um, that serve to justify the interests of dominant groups um, in society. Feminism is this idea or advocacy for the rights of women to be equal with men in all spheres of life. And more broadly, feminism, feminism is not just about the rights of women, but it's a rights um, to all genders, all um, sexualities, all, uh, all people of any color, um, any nationality, any ethnicity, any religion, that we're looking at people in an, um, on an equal playing field and that the rights for a human is the rights for a human, regardless, period, full stop, right? Um, and that feminism understands that all these systems of inequality, like racial inequality, um, gender inequality, all of these things are tied in together and that we can't bring down one without bringing down multiple of them. Feminist theory is a sociological perspective that emphasizes the centralness of gender and analyzing the social world and particularly the experiences of women. Um, there are many strands of feminist theory, many. Um, I teach the introduction of women, um, women and gender studies at another university, um, and we get into kind of some of those things. So if you do have questions about that, please let me know. And you have postmodernism, which is really this belief that society is no longer governed by history or, or progress. It's just um, pluralistic and, divide, uh, and diverse with no real grand narrative. Um, they claim that the very foundation on which classical social thought is based has collapsed. Um, this has its purposes in some ways, because when you're looking at technology and you're looking at the way technology impacts the world, um, so some of those classical theories are going to are gonna have some issues because they didn't really take into account because they could not even begin to fathom the amount of technology that we currently have. Um, on the flip side of that, some of those social, um, some of the biggest critiques of postmodern theory is the fact that um, we still have some of these main, we still use capitalism, we still have some of these main systems of inequality um, that all of these theorists were talking about a long time ago. Um, and so again, getting into, see, and now we touch on the media and TV programs and electronics. Again, most postmodernists um, work in the area of technology and technology's impact on individuals. Um, so there's no consensus on whether theory should be specific, wide ranging or somewhere in between. And that's kind of what we got at, right? So um, you're gonna have theories at multiple different levels and some of these other theories I'm gonna let you go through um, because there, there's something that it's important to understand that not all theory is going to work for every situation, but you're not going to 
need to know every single theory for every single thing because that's not that's not possible no sociologist does that <laughs> um, because we end up catering to whatever it is that we research or the topics that we want to explore um, I will talk about micro sociology and macro so micro sociology is really going to look at a more face-to-face -face interactions so you're going to look at how an individual um, interacts with another individual in society Based on the circumstances, you're going to look at how an individual interacts with a group or a group with an individual, so forth. You're really looking at more individualized interpersonal interactions, whereas macro sociology is going to look at large scale groups, organizations, social systems, institutions, that kind of thing. They're going to really look at the here's here's where society is laying out all of the rules and we're going to go over that. Right. Um, these two levels work when they're applied together um, the best. However, depending on what your research is, it's really going to determine what kind of theory you want to use. All right, I'm going to stop there and then I'll get into this in just a bit.